Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. My guest today is Martin Rowinski. He's an author. He's a corporate matchmaker, entrepreneur, referral marketing expert. So we're going to talk about uh, referral marketing and his background and uh, the book he's recently authored. So welcome, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Yeah. Tell me a bit about your background and uh, what attracted you to business and eventually referrals and things like that. Yeah. So I, I have a quite a bit of consulting background and some pretty good successes when I did that. So what really motivated me to start up uh, Boardseye in this case was the fact that I do find a passion in helping businesses and really taking them to the next level. So I started looking for opportunities that would provide me with some equity. So becoming an advisor or a board member, and there was just lack of resources to connect me. So that's kind of where Boardseye came about is uh, from the lack of available resources for that service. So we created that middle ground of connecting executives with opportunities so they can step in and help businesses. And now we're able to help many more businesses than I could have ever helped with uh, way better executives than I even are So or am. Yeah, that's kind of where that came about. So what kind of help do you provide to businesses? Um, Got to be a little bit more specific. Absolutely. So we have businesses literally from any industry you can imagine. And this is where my book came in, The Corporate Matchmaker. So what they come to us is different requests. There might be a business that's maybe looking to add new board members, strategically lacking a certain type of a skill that they're looking for in, uh, in their board to really take their company to the next level, or quite simply an advisor, basically same type of a skill set, but not come in as a official board member. They're just looking for an advisor. And sometimes we get lucky and we have companies that come to us and want to build out an entire advisory board, which is typically about five different advisors. So it can be anything. Uh, it can be a financial person. It can be somebody that can help them with funding, who has a deep network of executives and funds that they can connect them with. It can be a marketing person that they're searching for. So yeah, the level of experience in our database of executives that are members and part of board's eye is deep. So whether, you know, somebody's looking for somebody corporate or somebody that's taken a company public. What are some ideal compositions of boards? You know, like if a, if a company is at a certain point, what would be a appropriate board composition? Yeah, again, boards are different, obviously. And you hear of boards a lot at a publicly traded company level. But they do exist, obviously, at private companies. Most private companies consist of founders and co-founders on the board. But at some point when that company is growing, you got to bring in outside talent or independent board members that are not tied as a founder to that company. Compositions vary. Obviously, you got to have a composition of a financial expert that can do the audits. So you got, you know, you got your typical president, secretary, treasury. And then as the company grows, you also create committees that can be very specific to uh, whatever the company's endeavors are. So it does vary, but we truly believe in diversity and bringing executives at different levels, but also different backgrounds and not just the typical diversity that most people see, which is race. What's an important composition? Like 
who are the uh, key archetypes you want on the board, even if it's a small one? You definitely want people that don't only have experience, but expertise in that experience. So in essence, if somebody's never served on a board, even like a nonprofit company, then they're going to be coming with lack of executive board membership experience, which is different. As a board member, you're not coming in and leading the company on a day-to-day decision-making. You're coming in to be the strategic, you know, a meeting could happen quarterly. I mean, they might reach out and ask some advice. The CEO might reach out and ask for advice in between the quarters, but typically you're going quarter by quarter. So you got goals set. You adjust those goals as a board and you expect a CEO to achieve those goals. So in addition to helping people pick board members, how about how meetings are run? You know, where do you get expertise? And I don't know if it's considered corporate governance or yeah, just corporate governance. how to run a board. Like what, what are some of the nuances there that need to be known? So the great thing right now, obviously we're in a tech age and tech world. There's a lot of tools. So in old board meetings, you know, you would get a deck, you Usually, typically, if you got lucky, you might get the deck a week before and you got to go through a bunch of papers and sort through them. These days, things become a lot easier. There's companies, and I'll do some name drops, uh, Zek, Z-E-C-K, being one of them, and they really simplify this. It's a whole digital deck. The whole meeting can be prepared. It can be sent out ahead of time. It's easy to read through. It can be updated. Notes can be made in there by the board members before even the meeting. So by the time you get to the meeting, you're not talking about what's in the deck, but you're actually jumping straight into decision making. And obviously it becomes a tool also not just to drive the meeting, but also as a not taking, keeping records of what happened at that meeting, possibly taking surveys, decision making. So utilizing tech and tools for board meetings these days is a must. What about the structure of a proper meeting? Again, what uh, have you found? What if there's conflict? How do you manage it? You know, how do you make sure like meetings are effective and they're not just you know kind of waste of time where people are sitting there, you know, poking their eyes out with a pencil? So being board prepared or, or ready for the board meeting, utilizing the tech and the tools is definitely going to help you not have a time wasted. I truly believe that. And instead of talking about what's in the deck, you're talking about what solutions we can bring to the table. But as far as conflicts, that can go two ways, right? I mean, we're all human, so we're, there's always going to be a conflict. And if you have a good, diverse board, there's definitely going to be conflicts because every board member will have a different idea or different concept of a best solution. But saying that, I also like to say conflicts are not a bad thing and conflicts can actually create the best results at the end of the day. And the most important thing when it comes to conflicts is when you are composing, you speaking, you were asking me earlier about the composition of your board. I think the key component is making sure that every board member, diverse or not, but every board member truly believes in the company's mission, vision, and values. And as long as everybody believes in that, it doesn't matter if there's a conflict, the decision will be made according to what the company stands for and believes in, and it will be the best decision made for that company. What about your book? Tell me about that. And, you know, what was the motivation behind writing it? What's it about? So that was a twofold motivation, actually maybe even threefold. One, I've been bugged to write a book for a long time, even before Board's Eye, just to kind of tell my story, which chapter one covered that. I, I didn't need to dive into it any deeper than that. I got to tell my story, write my story of where I came from and my beliefs and my appreciation for being here in America. But Overall, the reason was we needed executive branding and we needed the companies and the executives to understand why there's a need, why there's a need for a board, why there's a need for advisors. It's become a lot more recently accepted that companies, privately held companies are actually bringing board advisors. They're seeing the benefits of it. So the book is written two-sided. There's a whole side of it that really focuses on companies, the benefits, talking about the diversity, the different chapter breakdown, how to build your board. And then the other side of it basically is for the executives, what to expect once you join a board, what will you bring to the table, what kind of a contract you're expecting. So it kind of covers both sides. It's very, I mean, it's not difficult to read. It's easy read. And uh, we're uh, finding it to be helpful for both our members to understand what they're getting into and companies really finding it helpful in uh, building their boards. 
how do people find board members? Do they need to be paid? You know, and how, is, let's say, a business person, how do you know when you're ready for a board, I guess? And then when you go to get board members, do you have to pay them? You know, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So there's obviously when you're uh, becoming a board member for a publicly traded company, it's a lot different than privately traded company. And a board member versus an advisor is also different. Most cases, publicly traded company, yes, you will have a salary. In a privately traded company, you will possibly have a salary and most likely equity. If you get both, that's great. If it's a company that's maybe in growing stages, they might motivate you with uh, equity to really bring a lot of value to that company. And obviously having equity will motivate anybody to bring value to a company and grow it. So those are the two ounces of it as far as uh, on the executive side. Knowing when somebody's ready, I think anybody that has any success, whether it's in the corporate world or an entrepreneur that maybe took a company and took it public, that shows success, that shows resilience, that shows like you can really help out. And now having that success behind you, you can do that for other companies and guide them along the way since you've been there and done that. So that's one aspect of it. If you have never served on a board, there's a lot of great education courses out there. And that is part of the reason we actually put together our own education courses. And as members join as executives, not the companies, but executives as they join and on our platform, they actually have access to board education. We've created four courses so far. We're working on a fifth one right now. That gives them a little bit of a dive of what's expected from a board member, how a board works, and uh, what to do when you do become a board member. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Okay. So like, why would someone want to be a board member? Is it a, is it a position that people aspire to or is it they're already successful and they want to give back? So then they, they're kind of donating in a way their time. Like, like who becomes board members and why? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think easy answer is everybody will have a different reason. Some people, yes, they simply want to give back. They're maybe retired, but they don't truly want to retire. Entrepreneurs especially are driven people that never see themselves retiring. So they just want to keep going, but maybe they don't want to do it full time. So becoming an advisor might be a perfect situation for them. And some people, when it comes to being a corporate driven person, a lot of times it's a prestige position and it's a great add to their resume or what they have done and accomplished in their in their career. So when someone's on a board, do they tend to go from board to board to board and make it a career or do people usually do it maybe like one part-time appointment and that's it? Definitely what I like to call career board members and some of them might be on four different boards, five different boards and that keeps them quite busy and some people just you know might still be working full-time and or have their own business and maybe they're sitting on one board as an advisor or maybe a board member and just uh, sit there and help out. So it, it can vary, but yes, you do definitely have specific executives that what I would call are board members for career. Yeah. Other people that once they serve on a particular board, it makes them conflicted and they can't serve on other ones. Yes. Does that ever come up? hundred percent it does. Obviously, if you're currently working, so you're a CEO at a specific industry, and you're looking at joining a board and that company is in the exact same industry as you are, it would be a conflict of interest. They will not be allowed, their company would not allow them to join that board. And we have, we have crossed that path. And that is one of the questions we ask, you know, what type of conflict of interest would you have? So we don't even suggest those opportunities to them. But yes, that has come up. Okay. Do you serve on any boards and you keep like a diary of board member type things? Do you do you do any ongoing um, education based on your personal experiences? Uh, yes, I do. And yes, I did. I was an advisor for a couple of different companies. 
And about a year ago, I stepped away from that and just became a, not a conflict of interest, but a conflict of time. And we're pretty focused on growth within Boardsai right now. So it really took away some time. As an advisor, you can spend quite a bit of more time helping the company than a board member. It's not a quarterly thing. And I felt like I wasn't giving 100% to the company as an advisor and figured they should go and find somebody that can give them more. And uh, so I did step away, but uh, it was a great experience. Okay. So what does the future of your work look like right now? Right now, we're still growing boards eye and the future is looking like we're most likely going to be doing a little bit more work internationally. So we're going to be growing into Europe a little bit more in the forecoming probably 2025, 2026. We're very focused on partnerships right now and a lot of referrals through a partnership, corporate partnerships. So we're talking to quite a few companies, really large companies, publicly traded in regards to the partnerships and how we can help with their members. So obviously it's all B2B related. What else are we working on? And uh, quite possibly aligning ourselves to take some chips off the table. It's funny when you say board's eye, I imagine the, you know, the bag of frozen vegetables, bird's eye. So <laughs> I guess that's where, was that where it was then from? No, it uh, wanted to find something short and catchy. Obviously we wanted the name board within there. Just about anything board was taken so that S I S got added as boards. I got added for international okay. boards, international boards. I gotcha. That makes sense. So where can people start engaging and learning? What's the, is it, should they get your book first? Is there a website to go to like how should people engage? Yeah. I think the best way to engage with us is definitely our website. You can learn quite a lot on there. There's a, within the menu at boards, com. on the main menu. If you click on about, there is a page under down the menu called the board suite. If you click that, you can really learn a lot about exactly what the board suite consists of. On the front page also, it's split into two. There's a uh, side that says executive and side that says company. So if you're a company looking for board members, definitely click the company. And if you're an executive looking for board positions, click executive to learn more. I mean, I can't say do not buy my book. I highly recommend buying the book. What about internships? What if you, if I wanted to volunteer on a board, I don't need any pay and I'm not going to vote and I'm not going to say anything, but I just want to be there and, and shadow or audit it. And, you know, so as an internship, are there opportunities like that for people that want to get started? hundred percent. And, you know, I always say even better than that, best thing you can do is join a nonprofit board. And even though you think you might not add any value, you never know. You might hear something in a board meeting and you might say something, your opinion, and you might actually bring some value to it. But it's a great experience to sit on a board for a nonprofit, especially if it's a cause that you believe in and uh, give back that way and at the same time gain some experience. We've recommended that many times to people that are looking to gain that experience. Okay, great. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Martin. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed. And, and shadow or audit it and, you know, so as an internship, are there opportunities like that for people that want to get started? hundred percent. And, you know, I always say even better than that, best thing you can do is join a nonprofit board. And even though you think you might not add any value, you never know. You might hear something in a board meeting and you might say something, your opinion, and you might actually bring some value to it. But it's a great experience to sit on a board for a nonprofit, especially if it's a cause that you believe in and uh, give back that way and at the same time gain some experience. We've recommended that many times to people that are looking to gain that experience. Okay, great. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Martin. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.